elderly World War I veterans who still fought in World War II. By the time World War II rolled around, there was a whole new generation who could be conscripted into the military. But there was also a host of older men who had survived World War I 21 years earlier. Three World War I veterans in particular stood out for their tenacity and audacious actions. Number 1. Walter Ernest Wally Brown, aged 56. During World War I, Wally climbed the ranks to become a sergeant in the Australian Imperial Force. Enlisting at the age of 30 in 1915 and traveling from Australia to Egypt, Wally soon switched from infantry to cavalry to more quickly see battle. He faked an excuse of having lost his fake teeth to be sent to the capital Cairo and from there transferred to the Western Front. Then, during the 1917 Battle of Passchendaele, when Wally's sergeant fell in the fight, he quickly took charge, leading the troops and storming in himself to rescue the wounded, despite the hail of bullets and grenades exploding around him. His actions earned him the Distinguished Conduct Medal. A year later, though, he outdid himself. At the Somme, a notorious battle site of World War I, and under threat of heavy machine gun fire and sniper attacks, he dashed toward an enemy post. Wally, who had nerves of steel, stood in front of the dugout demanding the enemy surrender. After a short fistfight, 11 soldiers of varying ranks and an officer accompanied him back to the Allied lines under heavy gunfire as prisoners. He was later awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions. Introducing Exter, the pioneer of trackable wallets, on a mission to elevate your everyday carry essentials. They're all about crafting sustainable wallets, bags, and accessories designed to make your life easier and more efficient. First up, they're super slim wallets, compact but incredibly spacious. It's astonishing how the Parliament wallet, for instance, is only half the size of traditional wallets, yet holds over 12 cards and cash effortlessly. With the signature Quick Card Access Trigger Mechanism, you can access all your cards at the click of a button. No more fumbling around through stacks of cards. Worried about data theft? Don't be. The built-in RFID blocking tech ensures that your personal information stays secure, protecting you from wireless skimming. Exter takes sustainability seriously. Their products are crafted using environmentally friendly materials like vegan Italian leather, ensuring that you not only look good, but feel good about your choice too. But let's talk specifics. The Parliament Wallet, one of many cool Exter products, features an extra pocket for cards or cash. It holds up to 12 cards and is available in six stylish colors. Elevate your everyday carry with Exter, where innovation meets style, security, and sustainability. Right now with the Black Friday sale, you can receive 55% off from November 10th to the 26th using the code SIMPLEHISTORY. Visit the website today to explore the wide range of products and upgrade your carry game with Exter. Link in the description below for a 55% discount. Exter, it's where smart meets stylish. Despite Wally's heroism and clear love for battle, he was discharged from the army in 1920. However, when World War II broke out in 1939, he was determined to return to the front lines despite being 54 years old. He lied, giving his date of birth as 1900 to be eligible for service. While he was eventually discovered and promoted, he chose to instead revert to gunner. Wally's life ended in Singapore in 1942. In February 1942, as the Allies were about to surrender, he reportedly picked up a few grenades, turned to his comrades, and said his last known words. No surrender for me. He walked toward enemy lines, never to be seen again. Despite being too old to even be there in the first place, Wally seemed determined to die on the front lines, epitomizing the phrase, I was born as a soldier, and I will die as one. Number 2. Adrian Carton de Viart, aged 65. De Viart is a prime example of someone who just refused to die. Already having fought in the Boer War, he was 34 by the time the First World War rolled around. And he didn't have a particularly lucky time of it on World War I's front lines. First, in Somaliland in 1914, de Viart was wounded in the elbow, ear, and eye. But this didn't deter him at all as he immediately charged right back into the fray, promptly taking a bullet ricochet to the same eye, resulting in its eventual loss. This might have been enough for some, but all de Viart had to say was that 
it had been the most exhilarating fun. A year later, at the Battle of Ypres, de Viert also experienced the effects of shelling, before having his hand literally blown apart. He spent the rest of 1915 with doctors, fruitlessly trying to save the damaged appendage before he demanded it was amputated instead. He called the amputation, no worse than having a tooth out. At La Boiselle in France, 1916, de Viart was back on the front lines. He was later awarded the Victoria Cross for controlling the other battalions after their commanders fell and exposing himself fearlessly to enemy fire something he doesn't even consider worthy of note in his memoir. Still, one hand and eye down, de Viart went on to become the youngest brigadier general in the Allies. But his streak of bad luck wasn't over. Before the end of the war in 1918, de Viart managed to fit in a good few more injuries, including a shrapnel hit ear, and then nearly losing his leg when posted to the Bantam Division. Despite all that, he still made it back to France for the end of the year, and in his memoir uttered the now famous line, Frankly, I had enjoyed the war. Despite his age, which was mature even at the start of the First World War, the Viart seemed to have a genuine love of battle that didn't change across the decades of his life. A few years after the war, the Viart left the military and spent 20 years in Poland. But before World War II broke out, he asked to be reinstated and was appointed to head the British military mission to Poland. He was now 59. In his memoir, de Viard doesn't acknowledge his own age, instead focusing on what the new technologies invented in the last 20 years meant for the face of battle. I saw the very face of war change, bereft of romance, its glory shorn, no longer the soldier setting forth into battle but the women and children buried under it. During World War II, he kept up his streak of refusing to die, first surviving a plane crash, then finding himself captured by the Italians and placed in a prisoner of war camp in Vinciliata. In 1943, he tunneled his way from the camp with others, escaping only to be caught eight days later and over 100 miles away, an impressive feat given his appearance and lack of Italian. At the time, de Viart proudly states both his and his escape partner's combined ages were 116, although clearly that did nothing to slow them down. After being sent back to the British as a token of good faith, de Viart retook his place in the military, flying to China where he somehow was involved in yet another plane crash, yet again escaping largely uninjured. Remarkably, that seemed to be the last bit of bad luck de Viart had during the war. After the war, however, he still managed to later slip and fall down a flight of stairs in Burma, breaking his back. He, of course, made a full recovery. George S. Patton, aged 60 George Patton, the famous American general of World War II, made a name for himself as an aggressive and tenacious commander who was fully of the belief, in war, nothing is impossible, providing you used audacity. It was this attitude that earned him the nickname Old Blood and Guts. Before that, however, he served in the tank corps during World War I, aged 32, where he studied tanks and advocated for full frontal attacks. In World War II, Patton's fame grew as he rose to the rank of general, and played crucial roles in the D-Day landings and the Battle of the Bulge. He very much believed in the phrase, we shall attack and attack until we are exhausted, and then attack again. The type of leader Patton was was clear, but despite his success, he evidently wasn't the nicest of men, as shown by his behavior during the 1943 slapping incidents. The aggressive general was visiting Italian war hospitals when he came across 27-year-old rifleman Charles Cool. Cool, suffering from battle fatigue, now known as PTSD, told the general, I guess I just can't take it. Rather than understanding or acknowledging in Patton's own words, he slapped him across the face with my glove, told him to get up and make a man out of himself. Patton later wrote in his diary, had other officers had the courage to do likewise, the shameful use of battle fatigue as an excuse for cowardice would have been infinitely reduced. 
While battle fatigue wasn't fully understood at the time, many still saw Patton's actions as outrageous treatment of a young, invalid man. Days later, Patton repeated his abuse to another young man named Bennett, slapping him multiple times and yelling at him, calling him a coward, and threatening to shoot him himself. His reprehensible behavior may have been overlooked in favor of his military might, but word spread. Eisenhower made him apologize for his actions. Fearful he would be forced to retire the general, that would, in his opinion, win them the war. The interim years between World War I and II only served to harden Patton into a highly effective, but aggressive and sometimes plain nasty man. He remained confident in his own abilities above all others, stating, It is my opinion that if the war ceased at that moment, troops under my command would have had the best and most successful campaign in history. I am still of that opinion.